Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Chappaqua Library virtual series. This is the Foreign Policy Discussion Group, and my name is Joan Kuhn. I'm the program coordinator at the library. Uh, today, we have a little, um, uh, it's a little different than what we usually do. We're going to be honoring our past chair of the planning committee, Mal Neches. Mal Neches has been the chair for many, many years. And on behalf of the staff of the Chappaqua Library, we want to um, tell you what a wonderful man he's been and how much we all enjoyed him, his smile, his corny jokes, and his unique intelligence. So thank you for uh, listening, and he will be truly, truly missed by the staff of the library. And now I would like to introduce Tyler Beebe, also on the uh, planning committee. Uh, thanks, Joan. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us. And before we start today's program, uh, the Foreign Policy Group's Planning Committee would like to take a minute to honor Mal, as Joan mentioned. Uh, Mal was our most active member. He passed away on January 30th. Now, as most or many of you know, Mal was the leading voice and spirit of the group, having spearheaded its creation over 20 years ago. With the help of Joan, Mal, and others who contributed to expanding the program, we've come a very, very long way over the last two decades. We've been able to attract a broad range of speakers who have enhanced our understanding of global affairs and US foreign policy. Now, Mal's keen interest, ongoing interest in foreign affairs, current events, and his skill at finding so many knowledgeable speakers were very instrumental in making all our efforts a great success. Those of us who knew Mal well will sorely miss his organizational talents, his social grace, and his wry sense of humor. We're certain he would be happy to know that we have recently added new members to the planning committee who are determined to carry on his enthusiastic and devoted efforts. So thank you, Mal. And let me turn it over now to Carrie Krams, who is going to play a short video of Mal in action. Good morning, Mal. Good morning, Joan, and thank you. Welcome to all of you. In a minute, I will introduce the facilitator of today's program, who will introduce the topic and our distinguished guest for the usual foreign policy at Chappaqua format. Please be aware that like all of our programs in the past several years, today's program will be recorded and then added to our library for later remote viewing. Please feel free to recommend viewing to friends and family. This has turned out to be one of the most active services of our overall program. At the conclusion of the lecture, our session facilitator will lead the audience discussion, which will be via typed questions and uh, Zoom Q&A, not chat, Zoom Q&A. We will do our best to feed as many of those questions to our distinguished guest as possible in the remaining time. Please push enter after typing your questions. Don, thanks for that lead in. Ambassador Gross, Grossman has agreed to return to foreign policy at Chappaqua in October to address the problem, this question, the, diplom the diplomatic service for the 21st century. Based on the work that he's done with, with others at the Harvard Kennedy School and throughout the, through the, out that area. So we're delighted to have, be a, have the opportunity to continue this, this conversation. I agree with Don. I need to go back and look at the video again. We've covered a tremendous amount of area, a lot of new concepts that I hadn't been aware of. And then I'm delighted that you've introduced, but it's, it's terribly important as far as I'm concerned. Well, I, I, I thank you for this opportunity today. Um, and I thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to come back in October. I wasn't sure you'd have me back uh, until you <laughs> saw how it went, but uh, I, I, I feel like we're, we're, I'm glad to come back. High level of confidence on our part. But many thanks <laughs> thank to you. our distinguished guest, as, as Don you. had said. Thanks also to Don, today's recruiter and moderator, to Joan Kuhn and her colleagues at the Chappaqua Library, Carrie Krams at New Cancel Media Arts Center, and all of you out in the world, wherever you may be, even if we can't see you, thank you for participating with us.
Until we meet again, please be safe. All right. Well, thanks, Carrie, and we will long remember Mal. There's no doubt about that. So now let me turn it over to Don Shields, who will introduce our speaker today. Don. Thank you, Tyler, and thank you, Joan, for getting us as far as we've got to, and thank you, Carrie, for uh, that clip of Mal. And I wasn't aware that I would also be part of that clip, so that was new. So now, uh, I wanted to say another minute while uh, keeping our speaker, Hans, who's on your screen, uh, in uh, advance for just a second or two, because we knew in advance that uh, Mal was not going to come back to us. And so early in January, Joan sent out a plea for new members of our planning committee. Otherwise, we couldn't see how we could continue. And thanks to June Blanc, uh, who replied to that quest, she has now joined our planning committee and she's been able to bring with her two other folks. Uh, there's a, a Frank and a Naomi, who will also be part of our planning committee. And you will see all three of those new people on the screen at, in our, as our session continues throughout this spring. This is our first start of the new year. And we're pleased to have with us Hans Christensen, and why he is here is because the New York Post on December the 10th of 2022 wrote in their paper, Vladimir Putin said Russia may shift its nuclear policy to a first strike strategy rather than a defensive one as his war in Ukraine drags on and the West's concerns about Russia's ties with Iran grow. The Russian president made the comment during a summit in, where was he, Bishkek, Christianistan, on Friday, where he said he was considering preemptive strike policy, a strategy he credited to the United States. Hans Muller Christensen, is an associate senior fellow with the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute Weapons of Mass Destruction Program. He is also director of the Nuclear Information Project at the Federation of American Scientists in Washington, D.C., where he is responsible for researching and documenting the status and operations of nuclear forces of the nine nuclear armed states. Hans is a frequent advisor to the news media on the status of nuclear forces and policy. Prior to his current position, Christensen was a consultant to the nuclear program of the Natural Resources Defense Council in Washington, DC. A program officer at the Nautilus Institute in Berkeley, California, and a special advisor to the Danish Minister of Defense. Join me in welcoming Hans Christensen, who will enlighten us about the possible consequences if tactical nuclear weapons were introduced in the ongoing war in Ukraine. Hans, we're turning ourselves over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Don. and. Uh... Thanks for the invitation to come here. Uh, I'm sorry for your loss, um, but I also hear there's a lot of energy uh, and, and success in continuing your organization. So that's good work. And um, like you said, I've been asked to talk here about this issue of nuclear weapons and the potential role or risk for the role in um, mainly in the Ukraine conflict scenario. Um, to do that, I have a series of slides that I will put on the screen now um, that, um, 
that'll walk you through this. Um, it is a broader description, if you will, beyond just the situation in, in Ukraine. Uh, I will, of course, talk about that also, but th that's probably something we can also get back to the in, in the questions and answers. So here I'm going to give you a quick overview of the status and history of uh, non-strategic nuclear weapons, which is a category of weapon there is most focus on right now because of the war in Ukraine. Um, I'll talk a little about the definitions because, of course, it is important to understand what people mean when they say tactical or non-strategic. Um, and then I'll do a brief survey of these countries that, out there that, act, that say they have tactical nuclear weapons. Um, you know, where are they? What do they look like? What's the trend? These types of um, uh, information. And then end with some summary and, and conclusions about where I think the status and the trend is in, in this role of tactical nuclear weapons. So let me just begin. Um, also, I'll say, of course, I'll, I'll share these slides um, with your organization so that you can get them later if you want to dive in deeper here. So I might be a little quick with some of it. Um, and we'll also put it on our website so you can make sure to download it from, from there later. Um, I just want to start with emphasizing that there has been enormous progress um, worldwide to reduce nuclear weapons since the Cold War. Um, even today, even though it's serious and, and we see some worrisome trends, it is nowhere near what it was during the Cold War. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, the, the Cold War was an, a very different phenomenon. Um, you know, nuclear forces were essentially rubbing up against each other every single day. Um, if not on land, then certainly on the oceans. Um, to, today, we've, we've cut the forces uh, significantly uh, globally, um, but the United States and, and, this, uh, and Russia still have by far the largest inventory. So the trends we see today, they are that, um, you know, the United States is continuing to sort of trickle down a little in terms of its overall numbers. Uh, we have a number of countries that have started to increase. Um, they include uh, the United Kingdom, China, and probably also Russia, Pakistan, India, and North Korea. Then you have two other country nuclear uh, powers that are more or less staying at the same level. That's Israel and France. And, uh, and we're up to nine nuclear weapon states so far. Of those countries, um, there are uh, three that officially say they have nuclear weapons. Um, so that's the United States, Russia, and Pakistan. These characterizations, in a way, have a lot to do with the Cold War, uh, when tactical nuclear weapons were used for sort of battlefield scenarios or very regional small uh, conflicts. Um, but after the end of the Cold War, I think most countries sort of moved away from that kind of thinking to a large extent, but they some have remained uh, has re have retained a lot of nuclear tactical nuclear weapons, specifically Russia. But I mean, you can see here that you know most countries around the world don't really operate tactical nuclear weapons. Um, they call all their nuclear weapons strategic, no matter what range or yield or or or, or that. Um, so definitions are important. Um, so to the to the right, you can see an image of. Um, the latest nuclear bomb that the U.S. is producing. This is a gravity bomb that is sort of a smart nuclear bomb that has a guided tail kit so it can steer more accurately toward its target. This is a weapon that will replace both tactical and strategic bombs in the U.S. arsenal. Um, and so it can be delivered by both long-range strategic bombers and short-range tactical fighter aircraft. So below there, you can see it. You know, to the left is the B-2 and to the right is the F-15. But it's the same weapon. It's just delivered from a different platform. One platform is called strategic and another platform is called tactical. So it, in a way, um, this categorization of weapons uh, is more about how a weapon is used than what it is. And we can get back to the details later, but I think that's an important distinction up, up front. Um, there is a misunderstanding, I think, or an oversimplification in the public debate about tactical nuclear weapons. Um, people tend to say that they have very small yields, 
um, and that strategic, on the contrary, have very high yields. And, and of course, there are those characteristics in those two categories, but it's too simplistic because there's a lot of overlap. Um, we have many tactical weapons that have high yields, and when high, I say, you know, 100, 200 kilotons um, of explosive power. And just to interject here, the, the yield of the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima back in 1945 was 15 kiloton. So anything normally above 10 to 20 kiloton is considered a, a high yield weapon. Um, today, there are yields in the arsenals that go up to several hundreds kilo, uh, kilotons. Um, the highest yield we have in the US stockpile is 1.2 megatons. Um, so 1,200 kilotons of, of uh, explosive power, uh, an insanely powerful weapon. Um, many weapons have several options. They have high yield options and low yield options. And the military can, can code it in before they use it, um, depending on what kind of target they're going to use it against and how much collateral damage, meaning radioactive fallout or what have you, they, they, they want to, to see from that attack. Um, so that's just a sort of a, a rough generalized uh, overview of these types and categories and the history. So let me now just talk a little about the US, then Russia, and then um, and Pakistan also. And then I'll get into the this, this stuff relating as part of the Russian uh, section, of course, about what's happening in Ukraine. So in the US stockpile, we are down to a very small number compared to what it was in the past that are considered tactical or non-strategic weapons. And uh, most by far are strategic on long range systems that can be land-based or sea-based long range ballistic missiles or the heavy bombers, the B-52s and B-2 bombers. We're down to just about 200 weapons that are all gravity bombs um, but used by the tactical fighter wings. The U.S. has been through an enormous change in its nuclear arsenal since the Cold War. It has essentially scrapped all, except these few tactical nuclear bombs here, it has scrapped all tactical nuclear weapons. The Army has become completely denuclearized. The Marine Corps is denuclearized. Um, the Navy surface ship and attack submarines no longer have tactical nuclear weapons. It's only the strategic missile submarines at sea that, that still carry nuclear weapons. So, the U.S. has changed its nuclear arsenal and its nuclear posture a lot. Um, so that's an important change and a, uh, something to keep in mind when we talk about you know, the other nuclear weapon states later on here. Um, I just want to mention that there's a, of these non-strategic nuclear weapons, about half of them we think they're deployed in Europe. They are at these bases you can see on the map here that's marked with red dots. Um, they're in underground vaults um, underneath aircraft shelters where they can be brought up and attached to the aircraft in case they have to be used. Um, and this is where this new bomb I showed you a video of before, this guided bomb, will now be deployed within the next you know, year or two. Um, that's a you know, modernization that's been underway for quite some time. Um, during the Trump administration, um, the nuclear post review of that administration recommended that the United States should add some new non-strategic capabilities to enhance its deterrence posture against what they described as sort of limited nuclear use scenarios. And they were thinking primarily against uh, Russia using nuclear weapons first somewhere. Their problems with, with the arguments that were used for those weapons, as far as I'm concerned, and I've listed some of them here, I won't go go through them all, um, but I'll just end by saying that uh, as soon as the Biden administration came in, they canceled um, the nuclear cruise missile that was proposed and also scaled back the rhetoric about the value of these uh, non-strategic nuclear weapons. But one of them was deployed. It's on the ballistic, on the ballistic missile submarines. It's a low yield warhead. It's out there now, both in the Pacific uh, and in the Atlantic. Um, the U.S. non-strategic nuclear weapons, um, they are, you know, mainly serving a, a symbolic purpose in Europe um, and in the, in the Pacific. Um, but this idea about reducing yields of uh, nuclear weapons is a very important uh, and increasingly important um, trend in the development. 
Um, and essentially it's about trying to reduce the number or the amount of collateral damage, radioactive fallout, unintended consequences from a nuclear attack. So on one hand, you might want to say, well, that's great because, you know, there'll be less dirty. On the other hand, you don't want to make nuclear weapons more usable or make it appear more acceptable to use them. So there are ups and downs to, to these kind of arguments. Switching now to Russia, um, you can see a graph to the top right there of the development of what we think is the number of tactical nuclear weapons. Um, and again, tactical being shorter range systems that don't have intercontinental range. Um, they have come down from close to around 20,000 uh, of such weapons uh, when the Cold War ended to somewhere that we think now is in the order of 1,000 to 2,000. Um, that is about 40% of their total uh, stockpile, their total inventory of nuclear weapons in their military stockpile. Um, so it's a significant reduction. But of course, they're in the middle and have been so for, been, been working on this for quite some time, um, a very significant modernization of their nuclear arsenal. So all these types of weapons are being upgraded um, and those they wanna keep are being, are being replaced with new types. And they have a lot of them and they have a lot of capabilities. Here you can see a map that illustrates where there are um, nuclear capable forces. Um, you know, that means aircraft, ground launch, uh, launchers, uh, you know, short range ballistic missiles, uh, ships, submarines, um, air defense systems, what have you, that, that are primarily conventional, like and use conventional explosives but also have the capability to launch nuclear if necessary. So they're called dual capable systems. Now, all these dots don't mean that there are actually nuclear warheads for those systems at all these places. The warheads for them are in central storage and those are the storage sites that are marked uh, with gray dots. Um, so, so these are still not fully operationally deployed but they could be brought out to the bases relatively quick. So if you look at where Ukraine is, for example, you can see there is a nuclear weapon storage site right next to the border. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's this one down here. Um, that is a nuclear weapon storage site that appears to be active. And as you can see, there are several gray ones that are nearby here as well. So if Russia was going to bring a nuclear weapons for use in U the Ukraine scenario, it would most likely come from one of those storage sites and be brought out to the launchers in the field. Now, as I said, Russia's modernization is, is sort of partly replacing older system, but also introducing some new system. But in the replacement of the older system, many of them uh, will go out the door. I mean, they'll simply not be replaced. You will have one coming in that can replace, you know, five different types. Um, so there are likely going to be fewer types uh, in the future. Um, but for now, it's a very busy modernization program. And you can see here in red on the table in, in, to the right, those are the, the, air, the, the weapon types where we think new ones are coming in or replacements for old ones. We also see an upgrade of their nuclear warhead storage sites. And here you can see some satellite photos of a storage site that is in the Kaliningrad region in the, in the, Balt, in the Baltic Sea area. Um, this uh, particular storage bunker, nuclear weapon storage bunker, has been under upgrade since at least 2016, probably a little earlier. Um, and so it's now, you can see on the picture to the right, beginning to take on its previous shape with the security perimeters intact and all that stuff. It was completely uh, unearthed and you can see in the middle, the black and white photo there, um, when they dug it all out, you could see the structure of what the facility actually looks like. It's a long storage hall where they can store the nuclear warheads. Um, this is sort of forward contingency storage site. Um, I don't think it's assumed that there are nuclear warheads there under normal circumstances but it's intended to, to, to have a capacity to bring them in if necessary. Um, in, in Ukraine, we've heard a lot about, in the Ukraine war scenario, we've heard a lot about the risk of Russian nuclear use. You know, will they do it? Or what are the circumstances where they could potentially decide to use nuclear weapons? Um, 
the U.S. nuclear, um, the U.S. intelligence community has uh, accused Russia of having what they call an escalate to de-escalate nuclear doctrine, where they would escalate to first use of nuclear weapons if a conventional aggression was not going well. <laughs> so in a way, that is, you know, the scenario we're seeing in Ukraine. Uh, uh, conventional aggression is not going well. Therefore, would they use nuclear weapons if they're pushed out completely? Um, so Russia has already issued several sort of thinly veiled uh, nuclear threats and some very explicit um, in the context uh, of the war, most importantly at the beginning uh, of the war and also during the annexation of the, the, the new uh, annexations of the Ukrainian regions. Um, and in all these cases, it's been sort of an, a generic threat, not really directed against Ukraine, but more directed against the West, meaning NATO. It's like, don't get involved directly. At the same time, it's hard to imagine useful nuclear options for, for Russia in Ukraine. You know, we can get back to the details about what such a scenario would look like, but you could imagine a couple of scenarios. One would be they're losing the war, so they will try to use a number of nuclear weapons to beat back the Ukrainians. That actually is a very complicated scenario, and they would have to use a lot of weapons to have a real impact on the battlefield. Um, but they could also use nuclear weapons to sort of signal we're about to escalate even further. You, you might hit a city or two or three or something like that. Um, and that could be sort of an attempt not to, you know, inflict particular, not, not to change the outcome of the war it's on the battlefield, but more influence uh, Ukraine's will to fight. You know, then, of course, there's the bigger scenario, which is that the Ukraine war could get out of control and it would spread and NATO would get more directly involved. Um, Russia might broaden the, the scenarios of, of attacks um, or, or NATO may decide to get more directly involved at some point. Out of that could come an escalation, a broadening of a war that is more a direct conflict between Russia and NATO. And in that scenario, it seems to me that it is much more likely um, that nuclear weapons could come to use. Um, we've seen most recently that Russia has somewhat walked back some of their statements about nuclear threats, saying that it's not really an option, you know, and that's not what the Ukraine war is about and, and these types of things. But of course, the intelligence communities of West are still closely following what the Russians are doing so far. There has been no reports of any actual preparation for nuclear weapons use or changing the posture that they have already. So I still think that the most uh, tense or, or worrisome face will come if Ukraine pushes Russia all the way out uh, of their, ter their, their annexed territories, and especially with Crimea. Uh, because on Crimea, you have the uh, Russian Black Sea Fleet and it is much more of a strategic um, possession on the part of the Russians. And so I think it will be um, worrisome and interesting to see what will happen if and when the, the war comes to that phase. Um, yes, last one, Pakistan is also a country that officially says it has tactical nuclear weapons. As, as other countries that have developed tactical nuclear weapons in the past, they argue that this is needed for them to be able to push back against a, an Indian conventional attack, not an Indian nuclear attack, but before it goes nuclear. India has much uh, stronger conventional forces than Pakistan. So the Pakistan is a word that the Indians could run over the border and threaten nuclear escalation if the, the Pakistani did something stupid. But their only chance really for knocking back those forces they believe uh, is to have uh, some short range tactical nuclear weapons where they can blow up these columns of tanks that come across the border. Uh, so this is a new development uh, with, with Pakistan. But I, but I wanna say also here that if you look strictly speaking at many of the other systems that Pakistan has and India has and China has, many of them would be called tactical or non-strategic if they were part of the Russian arsenal or the US arsenal. Um, so this is partly about how countries uh, describe their arsenals, but also how they, uh, how they intend to use it. I mean, of course, India, Pakistan are right up against each other. 
any nuclear weapon there is a new is a strategic nuclear weapon, regardless of whether it has a very long range or shorter range. Finally, North Korea has has started to talk more about tactical nuclear weapons explicitly. And this is worrisome, not just because they're building more nuclear weapons, but also because they might begin to think about an earlier use of nuclear weapons, not just a role for the final blow if everything else fails. So this could raise all sorts of problems about nuclear weapons coming into play earlier in a conflict than they otherwise would. Um, so these are some of the broad outlines of the status on, and the trends of nuclear weapons, specifically tactical nuclear weapons or shorter range non-strategic weapon systems around the world. And as I said, we have seen massive reductions. Um, and even in the case of Russia, despite uh, various claims of, of them increasing possibly, um, just within the last decade and a decade and a half, the number has uh, declined significantly. Um, but what's left is, of course, the important part. Um, and we see a significant modernization across the board, both of Russians, also US and Pakistani non-strategic nuclear weapons. Um, importantly, um, we're also seeing an increase in the rhetoric about the value of tactical nuclear weapons or the importance of limited scenarios, you know, small uses of nuclear weapons, just a few early use in a conflict, that type of stuff. This is a worrisome trend because it's really sort of taking us back to a, a mindset that we know full well from the Cold War days, where all sides had large inventories of tactical nuclear weapons and planned limited scenarios, et cetera, et cetera. Now we see an invigoration of that line of thinking and even introduction of new weapons that are supposed to fill that role. And of course, at the end of it, many nuclear weapon systems that are tactical um, are not just nuclear, they're also conventional. So when countries deploy them or say things about their capabilities or introduce new types, et cetera, et cetera, they can send very strong signals about nuclear intentions. Um, but they may not always be that because, of course, they also have a conventional role. So I'm saying this just because once you mix conventional and nuclear, um, it, it raises sort of uncertainties and, and, and risks that you can over interpret something and misinterpret something and then take, um, you know, do make a response that is that is out of sync what's actually going on. So that's those are some of the characteristics of where we are today uh, and some of the things to keep an eye out for. So with this, I think I'll just um, hand it back to the organizers and uh, hear if you have questions and, and uh, pushbacks. Thank you, Hans. That, you speak very well. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a delight to listen to you. And uh, a delight also, of course, you're well prepared with uh, overheads and slides and uh, facts and figures. And of course, the first question that comes to my mind is, how much can we trust these numbers? Yeah, well, so nuclear arsenals are normally secret. <laughs> That's to say that not always. Some countries have um, declassified some information. For example, the United States has declassified the entire history of its nuclear stockpile, the size of it. You can go back and you can just see how it went up and down during all the years. Um, recently, we have seen a change started under the, the, the Trump administration that they stopped releasing this. The Biden administration did it one year, but then this last year, it did not do it. Um, the Russians never say anything about how much they have, the Chinese, the other nuclear weapon states. The French have said sort of a, a general number from time to time, uh, but not a history. Um, the Brits have given some vague number, but but not not a precise number. So when we make these estimates, we have to take what's out there, official statements, intelligence assessments, um, and also look ourselves as force structures. You know, what what does a country actually deploy that it says is nuclear capable? And from that, for example, we can build estimates for India and Pakistan. Um, 
we can dive deep into the Chinese arsenal in a way we just could not do, um, you know, two decades ago, and all because of a an influx of information from social media and commercial satellite imagery that makes it possible to go and look at these things in ways we just could not do uh, in the past. So on the one hand, there's secrecy. On the other hand, it is possible to glean some pattern from all of this. Um, but I, I want to emphasize, and it's a good point, that these are estimates. That does not mean that these are the official numbers from those countries. Thank you for that. And uh, the question I have, the second one, has to do with the fact that after the Cold War, Ukraine inherited, as it were, a whole, a whole bunch of <laughs> nuclear weapons. And uh, they uh, agreed to reduce those to, to zero, from what I understand. And I, they have said, some of, the, some of their spokespeople have said since then, of course, that they wish they had not agreed to this in the past. But I wonder if you could just comment on that as to what Ukraine might have. Yeah, right. These days, of course, like you said, Ukraine does not have nuclear weapons. And, and there was a period until the mid 1990s where they had an inventory of leftover Soviet weapons on their territory. Um, there's a long debate about whether they could have used them if they wanted to, if they could have converted them to something that, you know, fits their purpose and arsenal. It's, it's, uh, it's one of these, you know, what if and what if, because the reality was that Ukraine chose to, got, to get rid of them because of the benefits um, that came their way in terms of nuclear technology, nuclear power technology, um, goodwill relations with the West, what have you. Uh, it basically helped their status. Russia has turned around and become an aggressor um, uh, in a way we haven't seen since the Cold War, of course. And so people are trying to sort of say, well, what, what if we hadn't? It's, it's a hypo hypothetical question. Um, I don't think they could have used the weapons directly that were left over. They might have been able to work on them for many years and trying to convert them to their own weapons or something like that. Um, but keep in mind also that the Ukrainian military until just a few years ago wasn't worth much, um, even at the conventional level. I mean, they were very poorly equipped. Um, so it's hard to imagine that a nuclear arsenal would have sort of could fit into that kind of level. Um, so anyway, who who can who can tell? But I just think things happened then, and now things are happening in another way. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the last thought I would have is there are so-called dirty bombs and <laughs> euphemistically called the clean bombs. And I want yeah. to comment on just what what what. What's going on in that that domain? Yeah, the dirty bomb um, was discussion was mainly a discussion about what if terrorists get their hold of nuclear material? Um, would they go through the complicated process of trying to build the nuclear weapon and then use it, or could they do it much more in a much more simple way and still create chaos, chaos by simply taking radioactive materials? put it in a barrel, surround it with uh, chemical high explosives and bring it into New York and blow it up. You know, so those are kind of dirty bombs that were intended to, that were, you know, intended to create, um, you know, panic and, and terror, um, but not considered as weapons in a way that we normally think about nuclear weapons. Um, that debate has sort of quieted down quite a lot uh, over the last half decade, I would say. Um, the concern today is much less about terrorists trying to get their hold of this stuff than it is about, um, you know, nuclear weapon states doing something bad or more countries developing nuclear weapons. So, so there's a lot of discussion right now about what is Iran going to do? Yeah. It, it had a nuclear weapons research program in the past. Um, as far as we hear from the intelligence community, it has not had one, an active one, since 2003. Um, and there's no indication that even though they're increasing the amount of fissile material that could be used for a nuclear weapon, that they have restarted the actual nuclear weapons program. Um, but it can change in the future, of course, but that's sort of, those are the kind of debates we hear today, but they're very, very dominated uh, right now about what the existing nuclear weapon states do. 
Yes. Tyler, have you got a question or Peter out there? Yes, I do. Yeah. Uh, Hans, what do we do about countries like, for example, South Korea, which uh, with which we're very sympathetic, uh, but which uh, shows an interest, obviously, in countering North Korea's nuclear capability? They want nukes, too. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the view of, well, do we try to discourage them or kind of get them to think eventually they might be able to do it? Or what's your thought on that? Yeah, it's a good question. This is a growing dilemma. Um, uh, it's not very widespread, um, but but of course, South Korea really is sort of a unique case right now. Um, South Korea, you know, in the past also tried to develop nuclear weapons and the United States, uh, I think it was back in the 70s, came down on them really hard and, and persuaded them not to. Um, in those days, the United States already had nuclear weapons in South Korea and continued to have that. Um, so it wasn't like we rushed nuclear weapons to South Korea and then said, see, now we're here to protect you. And then they agreed to not go ahead. Um, since then, when the Cold War ended, we pulled the tactical nuclear weapons out of uh, South Korea. Uh, there are no US nuclear weapons in South Korea today. Instead, to the extent that nuclear was necessary, we used our ballistic missile submarines and bombers to signal uh, to the North Koreans. Um, and we have focused our military posture in the South uh, much more uh, or entirely um, on, con on conventional capabilities. So South Korea today, ironically, is much, much more um, capable militarily than they've ever been before uh, and conventional levels. So it, it's somewhat of an irony that, that there are now, there are people in South Korea that are not pushing this idea that they might consider nuclear weapons. Um, what makes it particularly interesting right now is that it is the, the new president doing it. And he was sort of a hardliner on the outside, and now he's inside. And he's given a couple of statements recently that where he sort of left the possibility open. He didn't say, we are going to try to do this. And I think it's fair to say that the US government has been working hard since those statements, even before but certainly since those statements to dissuade them from doing that, both by deepening the integration of South Korea into the, the American nuclear planning for the, for the Korean Peninsula, to sort of reassure them that you see, this is serious stuff and, and you have an influence in, in how it would play out, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the good news is that um, there's a serious effort to try to push back against this. The bad news is this is a very deeply ingrained view in South Korea um, among the public. I think it's something in the order of 70 something percent that believe that South Korea should get its own nuclear weapons. Even though the US is stronger militarily in South Korea than it's been ever and the, the, the South Koreans also, excuse me, and also that US nuclear forces are deployed in the region and we flex that muscle from time to time with port visits and bomber overflights and what have you. So I think it's, it's you know, it's, we'll see where it goes, but I, but I certainly think it's important to push back on it. Um, not, not at least because the entire international non-proliferation regime, excuse me here, is built on the premise that countries like South Korea have promised not to develop nuclear weapons and stick to that pledge. If South Korea were to pull out of the, and walk back on that pledge, it could have easily a cascading effect on other countries around the world who would also um, begin to, to see that that was a thing you could do. You could pull out and if you can get away with it without too many, without too much push, pushback and, and sanctions, it might be a thing to do. So it's a really, really important thing to, thing to keep a lid on to prevent the, the international non-proliferation regime from unraveling. And I, I would think the uh, same theme would apply to Saudi Arabia, who of course, uh, or which of course wants to counter Iranian efforts to uh, develop nukes. Same. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, it's in all these um, dynamics, whether it's in South, whether it's Korea or in the Middle East or in Ukraine, you can see countries struggle with how to respond to threats in a constructive way. You know, 
it's easy to just to pile on more weapons and say, now we're stronger and you should be deterred more because we're stronger. But it doesn't always work that way. You could also, it can also help trigger um, developments in the other countries that, that, that make them go nuclear or make them more aggressive or more concerned or what have you. Um, so all countries, no matter who they are, struggle with this dilemma. Uh, what is the best way to counter these things in a way that doesn't make it worse or the situation more dangerous? Um, so I, I would say that if you look at Ukraine, for example, the good news about the Ukraine scenario is that the West has actually been enormously careful when it comes to how to respond to the Russians' nuclear saber weapon. They haven't taken the bait. You know, they have not gone in and said, well, we can we can nuke you too, or yeah, we should deploy something off your coast, or I mean, whatever you could imagine uh, could be the response. Um, and I think the reason is that you don't really have to. You can communicate these things in other ways. The Russians know full well what the capacity of US nuclear forces are, and there's no need to go there. So I think it's 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 a good strategy. It has worked well so far. It's more important to try to lower the Russian rhetoric on this. Um, but like I said early on, it is still uncertain what will happen once we get to the final phase of the Ukraine war. If Russia loses completely, what will it make them do? And um, that thing is um, a serious, serious issue to manage uh, once we get closer to that phase. Thank you. There's a question from Ed Lannert on our uh, Q&A. Do we know the consequence of using tactical nuclear weapons in terms of, enter, of range of destruction, radioactive fallout, et cetera? Yes. Um, so the, pen, the, the core here is where, where do you detonate your weapon? Uh, how high up in the atmosphere is it? Um, are you doing this to create a pressure wave that has to go out and, and destroy things on the surface? Are you, are you detonating it on the ground because you want um, an underground facility to be destroyed? Um, and what is the yield that you choose for your attack? You know, you can, you can choose the yields that are in nuclear weapons go from around one kiloton, like I said, all the way up to 1,200 kiloton. And, and so there is a vast range of yields you can choose. So it all depends what you want to accomplish. But you can remember what we saw in, from Japan in, in World War uh, II, two nuclear weapons uh, detonated over the cities, one 15 kiloton, which today actually would be considered somewhat of a low yield nuclear weapon. Um, they devastated, devastated that city. Um, and Nagasaki was about 20 kilotons. Um, devastated the cities, radioactive fallout, humanitarian consequences, <laughs> you name it. Um, for Russia to use nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons in, um, you know, in, in Ukraine, they would have to use a significant number to have a measurable effect on, on where the war is going. You know, they would have to knock out many facilities to weaken the Ukrainian forces. Um, using them against battlefield, like you know, troops in, 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 the, in, the, in the field, is, is much less efficient. Um, but of course, if you do detonate it on the ground, you would get the tremendous heat from the explosion, sucking up material from the ground and dispersing that into the atmosphere. And that will, of course, fall as radioactive fallouts, depending on where the wind takes it and how much uh, precipitation there is going, you know, make, if it's snowing or raining, um, it could fall closer or further away from, um, from, from the point of detonation. And this is actually a, it's a big uncertainty uh, for anyone who wants to use nuclear weapons, that if you do, a, if you use a fair number of them, you're not, you could, you could very well risk that the, some of the radioactive fallout flies back over you. Um, your own territory. Uh, prevailing winds uh, over Ukraine are not favorable to a Russian nuclear attack. 
Um, so there are these factors to think about. Now you could also, if you just want the pressure wave, you can detonate your weapon at what is known as the optimal height of burst. And that's height over the ground where the fireball from the explosion does not touch the ground. The pressure wave is going out and radiation is going out, um, but the pressure wave does not cause that sucking up uh, or the fireball doesn't touch the ground. So the material is not incinerated and brought up into the atmosphere and that significantly reduces the radioactive fallout. So all of that just to say that there are different ways you can influence how much radioactive fallout or collateral damage you want to have from, um, you know, from a nuclear attack. Once upon a time, we heard about the neutron bomb, where yeah. it would kill everybody but leave <laughs> the infrastructure in place. Uh, yeah. We don't hear about that anymore. No, that's true. It was a particular phenomenon of nuclear strategy and, and, and deterrence conversation back in the 1970s and 80s. Um, and the, the, the general idea was a neutron bomb, instead of, instead of emphasizing blast effect, it emphasizes radiation. So you have relatively little blast effect, but you have very intense uh, radiation coming out from this thing. And it was ironically sort of a, a weapon that was intended to, well, reduce collateral damage because you could pop it over incoming Soviet tank formations and it would have relatively little effect on sort of the, the physical infrastructure in the area, um, but it would kill uh, the troops. Um, we know the United States played with this technology. The Soviet Union did it, of course. The Chinese also developed the apparently a, a neutron bomb type of um, weapon. Not that I think they have actually fielded it, but so different countries played with this technology, but it has generally not proven to be very useful. Um, and it's not something we see that is uh, pushed uh, in any particular way right now, at least. Thank you. I was thinking this morning that my daughter, one of my daughters <laughs> turned 51 a couple of days ago. And 51 years ago, when she was born, I was taking a course in, at Carleton University in Ottawa on tactical nuclear weapons and all of those things as to the a course really on the military mind. And yeah. I remember at that time, there were very few gurus in this area. And the two of them were Herman Kahn, who you probably are aware of. And the other uh, book at that time was by Kissinger. And here he is still carrying on yeah. after all those 51 years. And he yeah. can't have been too young at the beginning of that. But anyway, at that time, from what I took as a student, was that you wouldn't fool around with just coming back with tactical weapons. You would destroy a city or two to show how serious this was. And from what you have been saying, one gets the idea that we're kind of willing to pay what was called, what is it, tick and tack or or one of those scenarios where you kind of play along with your opponent. And uh, I, I, that part of it, it's very difficult for me to understand as to why you would not be very serious in re your reaction to even tactical weapons. In other words, you, you would take this so seriously that you would destroy perhaps Moscow or something of that nature. And I, that, that part of the, the argument I've carried over these years, of course, and now arrived with you, thankfully, being part of us. And uh, I wondered if you had a few comments on that, uh, the strategy of it all. Yeah, very good, very good question. Um, there are two sides to that, or two aspects of that, I think, the answer here. One has to do with the people you started talking about <clears throat> that, um, most of the people that were involved in running and managing the Cold War uh, are either very old uh, or have already died, but for sure, the people that are actively involved in 
the intelligence communities, the military services, uh, government at large, institutions that look at this and analyze it are of a younger uh, creed. You, you know, they don't have the direct experience from that time. So on the, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a risk here, of course, that we learned lessons during the Cold War. Um, and quite often there was a personal impression. It left a personal impression on you to have been in that very tense uh, period. Um, and I've been out and talking to people, uh, for example, in universities about war game, nuclear war scenarios. And I did a game up in, um, uh, up in Vancouver one time with the university there. And we had two groups that were playing that. Um, one, one was the faculty, like the teachers, and the other group was students, right? Yes, yes. And then we interacted with them and said, we, we played each group. And what was striking was that the, the teachers, they kept having second thought. They were like, <laughs> I don't believe that intelligence. Why are you telling me that? They, you know, they were so skeptical about everything that was fed to them, right? They really didn't want to do this. Whereas the students, they were like, nuke them, you know, go <laughs> win. I mean, it, it was like a computer game in a way for them. Yes. Uh, that was a striking difference in terms of generations. <laughs> um, so I think that's that's one element of, of what I want to say. The other one has to do, of course, with the strategy. Um, different countries plan their strategies differently depending on their you know political geographical situation but also on their military capabilities um you know russia sees itself as surrounded by adversaries you know right now it's a friend with china but who knows how long that'll last but the point is when when we when we focus on russian tactical nuclear weapons um think of it from russia's perspective many of their adversaries or potential targets yeah. don't have to have intercontinental range, right? No. You can do that with shorter range systems. Yes. That doesn't necessarily mean, therefore, you're going to just throw tactical nuclear weapons left and right. I think the Russians are very, the Russian military is definitely very and keenly aware of the consequences of this. So when you say, you know, why would we be cautious? Why wouldn't we, like, you know, threaten to, to nuke Moscow? Of course, that option is by, you know, down there in the background. But the reason is, of course, US and Russian nuclear forces are structured in such a way that neither side can take out the other one. Not, they cannot hope to knock out everything. So even if we did everything we possibly could in terms of taking stuff out, um, something would survive and it would come back at us. So this is a very, you know, central part of um, sort of this dicey balance of terror that if you're lucky, you can hope to deter. But if things go wrong and deterrence fails, what do you do then? What are the steps you need to take to again persuade the guy who hit at you, don't go any further. Instead, de-escalate the conflict, go back to, you know, a more safe situation. That is the big, 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 big unknown. Um, many people fundamentally doubt that it would be possible to control escalation, especially with large nuclear weapon states. Once you start using this, the other side is not going to say, oh, yeah, you're serious. I'm not going to do this anymore. They're going to say, we got stuff. We can hit back at you. We're going to do this, and we'll make you uh, think twice. And then they know they can do it again and do another round. So. Once that it gets to that level, I mean, all bets are off. Um, and you can talk to many, many officials who have been in war games uh, over the decades, and they never end well. I mean, that's the thing here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it's a, it's, that's why I emphasized in my briefing, I think it's a really dangerous thing than when countries begin to talk more positively, <laughs> more sort of um, about the idea that you can use tactical nuclear weapons to some kind of an advantage. Because uh, I think once you use nuclear weapons, um, things start to move fast. Um, that's between two large nuclear weapon states. It's different if you have a large nuclear weapon that's state and a smaller one. Um, because of course, the larger one has you know, a better chance. 
Um, not to say that the smaller couldn't inflict a lot of damage. North Korea is a good example. Yes. Why on earth would North Koreans want to take on the Americans at a nuclear level? Why? But if you go down in flames, you might want to do it really, really convincingly. And that's, it seems to be what they at least up to now been trying to convince us about. Yes, and you got, for example, Japan in the middle there somewhere. Absolutely, yeah. Other countries, these other countries have an interest too. <laughs> They're not nuclear powers. Oh yeah, the North Korean nuclear weapons, if they were used, would mainly hit targets out in that region, of course. You know, maybe they have some ICBM capability that can reach the United States, maybe, but they certainly have capabilities that can reach Tokyo, Philippines, South Korea, places like that. So this is real for countries that, that are in that region. And you were talking a moment ago about uh, Russia feeling surrounded and, in, and now we've got uh, both Finland and Sweden yeah. closer to them. So there have been a historical agreement, a gentle person's agreement, I think, uh, between Finland and Russia that there be open borders and whatever without Finland joining NATO. And now Finland is ready to, to join. It's very interesting, that whole dynamics and, and uh, power struggle in addition to the nuclear position that we're talking about. Peter, I wondered if you were had a question of our speaker, Hans. Yes, thank you, Don. Thank you, uh, Hans, for all these good remarks. Uh, I wanted to ask a little bit about the broader frame of negotiations or diplomacy around uh, non-proliferation, and a little bit more, more specifically, uh, what, is the, what are the prospects for more nuclear-free zones like the one in Central Asia and there's some others? Um, and secondly, uh, how effective do you think the Atomic Energy Agency has been and will be? And third, I think they're all related. How serious and effective are U.S. administrations, and I mean both the administration and Congress, in pressing ahead with this in a concerted way? Um. Could you deepen the, the last question a little to what you mean by when, when you say Yes, uh, it strikes me that what you've been talking about is one of the most important things in public policy. I hear very little communication from any administration to the public about what's at stake here mm -hmm. and how we're doing it. And it makes me wonder, are we doing it well? Do you think the US is really putting the muscle and the brains in this that are required. Okay, um, on the first one about arms control arrangements like nuclear weapons free zones. Um, yeah, they were, nuclear weapons free zones were very important um, conceptual ideas during the Cold War as, a, as sort of try to put buffers in between nuclear weapon states or, or large military powers. Um, and after the end of the Cold War, they became sort of instruments of trying to um, cementing a, a, a strategic situation that, you know, this is nuclear weapons free zone, you know, don't, don't start doing things here. You know, it's like just trying to carve out areas that were um, supposedly safer. <laughs> um, of course, nuclear weapons free zones were only agreed to by nuclear weapon states if they did not affect their operations. <laughs> Like, so for example, uh, the US would not sign on to a nuclear weapons free zone if it's if it inhibited its operations with um, naval forces or you know, air forces and things like that. Um, the same goes for um, today we have a new treaty, um, the popular called the Ban Treaty. It's a treaty that's been adopted a few years ago uh, in the United Nations and I think about 100 or so, over 100 people, uh, countries have signed on to this treaty. And of course, it's about prohibiting nuclear weapons on a global basis and, and getting started to you know, get rid of them and all that kind of stuff. The problem, of course, again, is that the nuclear weapon states don't want to be part of it. 
So other countries in a way can say what they want. Um, so, so I think these arrangements are more to, one, one way to think about them is more like a expression of frustration about the nuclear status. You know, then countries gang up and they go in and make agreements like this or zones or what have you, because they think things are going crazy and, and, and we should move in another direction. Um, that goes for all kinds of arms control, of course. The nuclear weapon states themselves are only interested in arms control arrangements if they think there is a benefit to their national security situation. So during the Cold War, we saw arms control agreements um, come up because nuclear weapon states were concerned about where this was going. And so they were trying to make agreements to put a lid on what the Soviet Union could do. And the Soviets were trying to put a lid on what we could do and deploy. Um, it was a way of managing strategic competition. Um, the INF treaty that, that Reagan um, and Gorbachev signed was also a treaty that eliminated an entire group of weapons considered some of the most dangerous because they were so you know, fast flying or could sneak in or were particularly sort of focused on the European wartime, war battle scenario. Um, so that was hugely important, um, but they saw it in their national uh, interest to do that. Um, but of course also had broader um, international uh, repercussions. Then the Cold War ended and we got arms control treaties like the New START Treaty. And to me, it's it's as if, yes, that treaty is about managing a strategic competition, but, but not so much as it was during the Cold War. Now the fundamental purpose of that treaty was more to manage a controlled drawdown of remaining forces and make sure that we have a lid on so neither side has to do worst case scenario planning. And so as a result of it, if you look at today, how US modernization is structured, it is, it's assuming that the new START treaty force level will be in effect, you know, indefinitely, which it of course won't because the new START treaty expires in 2026. And the way things are going right now, it's hard to imagine that, that you could make a new agreement, new arms control agreement with the Russians. It's certainly hard to imagine that US Congress would approve one. Um, so we'll see where that goes, but I'm just saying arms control plays different roles in, in, in Cold War and post-Cold War uh, scenarios. IAEA, absolutely, I think IAEA has been uh, a phenomenal success in, in, in terms of its safeguard work to, um, to monitor and report on uh, activities uh, that could violate countries' pledges not to develop nuclear weapons. Um, we've seen that in play in several uh, key, key areas. For example, uh, North Korea, of course, was one example where until the 90s at some point, they were allowed to have inspectors in there and they were in there and they were you know, monitoring their systems. But when the North Koreans decided to go nuclear officially, they kicked them out, right? And, you know, things haven't been, been well since. Uh, Iran, the same thing. Um, the JC, JCPOA agreement um, that existed until um, President Trump pulled the United States out of it, um, that treaty has um, sort of been struggling to try to get back in a sort of a refreshed form. Uh, but, um, but, but, but right now it doesn't seem like it's gonna happen uh, because of what's happening in Ukraine and what's happening in Iran with, it, with the regime. Um, but overall, nonetheless, think about it. Back in the Kennedy days, in the 60s, it was widely assumed that there would be something like 25 plus nuclear weapon states in the world today. That did not happen. So this is because of a lot of different things, but, but IAA has been an enormously invaluable instrument in trying to secure uh, that pledge not to develop nuclear weapons. Finally, what's at stake? Are we doing enough? Um, well, I, there's two, th two things to say about that. One is that you can always do more, and, and perhaps they should, um, but it's also about how does a country react to nuclear threats? 
And right now we're somewhat in a dilemma, I think, um, because of course, very much focused on what Russia is doing, increased threat. China is building up its nuclear arsenal as a tremendous pace. Uh, my organization was one that um, discovered uh, construction of hundreds of missile silos uh, in the Chinese desert. Um, so there are these two huge new developments. Um, and what do you do about that? So there, there's a camp that says, well, that means we have to build more. We have to be stronger militarily. We have to be out there and in your face. And, and then there's another camp that says, gee, yes, that is dangerous. Therefore, we must do more to reduce nuclear arsenals and reduce tension. So whenever we have these, um, these situations, people tend to react in these two fundamentally different ways. Um, and so I think, like I said, the US has been so far good at responding very cautiously at the nuclear level to what Russia is doing and no need to go in for a tit for tat there. Um, but at the same time, we're also really pushing conventional modernization and deployments in Europe, which of course seen from Russia is like, oh, <laughs> so the, 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 the threat is growing for them. The threat is increasing for them. And so that could actually help, you know, cement their belief in tactical nuclear weapons and, and make them believe that that is even more needed in the future. So it's very, very difficult to, you know, to, to execute these kind of grand strategies and, and figure out how, you know, you most constructively try to influence um, what is happening out there. But um, I'll just give you one last example, then I'll be quiet. Um, and that was just a few days ago, the, the US Strategic Command sent a letter to Congress well, actually, sent last late last year, but but it's in an unclassified version here, um, just a few days ago, <clears throat> that said that China now has more intercontinental ballistic missile si or launchers than the United States. That means ICBMs, land-based ballistic missiles. <clears throat> but it also said, but they don't have more missiles in those launchers. And they also do not have more warheads on missiles in those launchers than we do, right? That thing, that letter goes straight into the, on the front page of the House Armed Services Committee with a big fat line at the end of it saying, this means we need to have more nuclear weapons. Wow. So the, the dynamic is instant. And, uh, you know, people react in these old fashioned ways and there's almost like sort of an autopilot about it, uh, which is really, dis you know, really worrisome. Um, so all that's just to say that it's important that cooler heads prevail. And Hans, you're one of them. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> For being a cooler head and being part of us today. I do appreciate your being available, first of all. And of course, you came to us as an unknown in that one sense that we had not participated with you before. And on another sense, we're so bloody grateful <laughs> for <laughs> coming and mm -hmm. with your expertise and your common sense approach as we see it. So we hope that you are going to appear before this, <laughs> these committees of Congress in ways <laughs> that will temper whatever they're thinking about in, in, expanding back to the thousands of numbers of, of warheads, for example. So thank you again. I know Joan wants to come back on and uh, talk a little bit. And thank you, Hans, for being part of this. Thank you. Thanks very much. And thanks for having me here. It's been a great pleasure. Thank Joan. you. Thank you so much, Hans. This has been I don't know if I'm more comforted or scared, more scared than I was before this um, presentation, but it was certainly very informative and it was uh, easy to listen to. Uh, you know, you've, it was very, very well done. Thank so you. Thank you again for coming. And thank you, Don and Peter and Tyler for your questions and for participating in this.
And I will end this now and just thank you again. And I do hope we, that we see you again. Absolutely. Anything else anyone want to say? Nope. Okay. Bye, everyone, and have a good evening. A good day. Bye-bye.